Great. Well, thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you, everyone, for being here, actually. So uh, before I get started, I just wanted to make sure that I acknowledge also all the people that made all of this possible. Of course, whenever we're doing this type of work, we're not doing it by ourselves. We actually have a lot of students. Uh, two of the students are highlighted there, Alirasa Drafsun and Amira Locker. So they have uh, both graduated, and they got their PhDs already. And there's a few other students that are also working towards their PhDs as well. Uh, also, in terms of collaborators, we have also other people from the electrical and computer engineering department, Alper Boskor and Michael Sikitui uh, in particular. So before I go into the more technical stuff that we've been working on, let me tell you a little bit about myself uh, and the things that I have done and how I actually got here too. Uh, so first of all, I was born in Peru, so that's where I'm originally from. I came to the States when I was about 15 years old. Uh, at that point, actually, like, I decided that I was going to go for an undergraduate degree at, at Seattle. So that's where, when I came to the States, I went straight to Seattle. Uh, I decided that I was going to go to Seattle University for a degree on electrical engineering. Right? And just to give you a little bit of an idea, this is more or less how it all happened. So when I was a little kid, I was a big fan of one particular TV show. Uh, the TV show was Transformers. You know, maybe like there's a lot of remakes and the movies were not all so great, so maybe it's not the same as before. But you know, I really love Transformers, right? So I, I knew that I wanted to do something related maybe to robotics at some point. Um, but I didn't know exactly what to do. So when I was looking at undergraduate careers uh, on opportunities, it was maybe either mechanical engineering or electrical engineering. I figure mechanical engineering, I can put things together by myself so I can figure it out by myself. Uh, but I don't really know how like electronic components work. So I might as well go for electrical engineering. So that's what I decided to do. Uh, but uh, as I was taking some of the courses, as you know, it probably has been the case for many of you, you realize that you have this passion for mathematics. So all of a sudden, you keep on taking courses, and you realize that you really want to get into it. So uh, at that point, actually, one of my advisors recommended maybe you should add a degree uh, on mathematics. So I said, well, what do I need to do? Oh, you need to take some more math courses. I was like, OK, I like that. So sure, why not? So I decided to go for a math degree uh, at that point. But I still had no idea what it meant to be a mathematician. Actually, I didn't know what it meant to do research in general. Uh, so it was actually like one. During my second year, uh, when I, I was walking down the corridor at Seattle University when I saw a flyer, and that flyer basically said something about, um, if you're interested, you, know, you can do mathematics during the summer, um, we'll pay you, and you get to go to Puerto Rico. So this was actually the CIMU program that Eva, Ricardo, uh, Herbert, and others have like, uh, put together during that time. So this was 2002. Um, I was very interested in participating, and you know, I was very excited you know, about doing mathematics and all of that. And the fact that it was in Puerto Rico was extra, extra bonus for me as well, too. right? So why not? Uh, that's what I decided to do. So I participated on this summer program at CIMU in 2002. So this is actually a picture of uh, us. So this is one of the groups, uh, the group that I was part of. And that's Ricardo. You can see right there in the middle. Um, so yeah, so this is many, many, many years ago. And since then, I've been involved with the math community, uh, participating in SACNAS, um, and, and all of that. So these are actually, this is how I actually decided that I wanted to do research. Right? This is how I decided I wanted to go to grad school. I actually decided that I was not going to pursue a PhD in electrical engineering. I actually was going to pursue a, a PhD in mathematics, applied mathematics. So I got into Berkeley. Um, uh, I started doing my PhD there. Um, you know, I was looking at PDEs. Uh, I really liked uh, the work that I was doing there. But all of the time, I was taking a numerical methods course, and I kept on waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning. And I just kept on asking myself, why am I waking up at 3 a.m. in the morning? It wasn't a stress. Um, it was actually that I was very excited to work on something in particular. And I realized that that something was what I was applying these particular numerical methods to. Right? So I had chosen. Uh, consciously, I guess, uh, to work on a robotic system that I was modeling at that particular point. And I was really enjoying the applications to that. So I realized that, well, either I need to stay in the math department and work with uh, engineers, or go to the engineering departments and work with mathematicians. It turned out to be easier to do it, to do the transfer. So that's what I decided to do. So I transferred at that point to the math, uh, to the electrical engineering and computer science department at Berkeley, and decided to pursue my PhD. So I started doing some, um, uh, actually, optimization, control theory, uh, so on and so forth um, 
from that side. Uh, but then eventually, basically, I realized that I also like other applications. So I started to work on computer vision, machine learning applications. Uh, actually ended up using some algebraic topology, and I'm gonna mention some of those things in here too, uh, to apply it to computer vision in particular. And, and then since then, I've been using some of these techniques to other applications, and that's what I'm gonna present today. Uh, just quick recap on other things. After that, I got a postdoc at UNC Chapel Hill, so I was in more robotics at the time, and now I'm a faculty at North Carolina State University. Um, yes, I like it, so sorry. I, I switched to the dark side, I know. <laughs> okay, so uh, and, and I think this, all of this comes from the very beginning, right? Like, uh, you know, my dream of working with robotics. So I really like the idea of actually applying a lot of these techniques. I really like the mathematics. I apply it and work on it all the time. But at the end of the day, I want to see a little bit of the applications. So instead of work, starting with the theory, I'm actually going to start with the applications. Uh, uh, and, and we actually get to the point that we're actually applying it to the systems, right? So one of our uh, uh, applications that I'm going to talk to you about is the cyber insect uh, networks that we're going to be discussing. And what is this motivated on? Uh, imagine that there's some sort of disaster. So for example, like a building collapse, there's an earthquake, tsunami, you name it. Uh, and then there may be people, first, uh, you know, uh, rescuers uh, that at that point are having to go to those type of environments, risk their lives to try to identify or find any people that may need some assistance, right? So the idea is that instead of risking the life of these people and also to try to do it more efficient, maybe we can actually use robotic systems. So maybe we'll have a swarm of robots, some of them in the ground, some of them aerial. And what we wanna do is aggregate the information from all of these different agents, create a map of the scene, figure out what's happening in there, get um, some context awareness, and then from there basically be able to identify whether we send a larger robotic system or maybe we just send people at that point, right? But that's the idea, right? So we're trying to automate some of the process and be able to learn something about this environment that we have in there. Of course, a lot of people have proposed using a lot of different type of platforms Platforms. There's a lot of different robotic platforms. Uh, some of them are bio-inspired, so robotic platforms are inspired, for instance, in cockroaches. And, and this is actually a collaboration or a, an idea that we had with uh, some of the collaborators that I mentioned earlier. Why not, instead of trying to use actually robotics inspired on cockroaches, why don't we actually use cockroaches that have some robotic components, right? So this is basically what it looks like, yeah. So they're not that big. They're actually a little bit smaller, right? Uh, but they're still about like two inches in length, right? Something like that, two to three inches in length. Uh, they do have a small little cute backpack that you put to them. Um, I usually just Velcro those things in there, uh, use some hot glue, you like put them in the fridge first, you know, they go to sleep, put some hot glue, glue this thing on top of them. Uh, and then the way how they're actually connected or how they get controlled is that there's, uh, and they're a little bit hard to see, but there's some electrodes that go directly to their antennas. And, uh, and what happens is that you have this small backpack, you have wireless communication, you send commands to the backpack, the backpack basically sends signals, uh, impulses to the antenna, so it turns to the right, to the left, um, depending on what you want to do. And that's basically what you're able to do, right? So you trace basic a trajectory, you're sending them commands. I don't know if you can see it, but there's an LED saying how often you get the commands. And then you can actually tell them to go in a straight line, go right, left, stop, move forward, right? So those are the basic commands that you have for the actual biobot. That's what we call them, biobots, right? Uh, so yeah, so that's the idea. So the idea would be instead of having just one of these guys, of course, you know, one may not be very helpful. It may not give you enough uh, information about the environment. You can put other sensors, of course, in here, microphones, temperature, gas sensors, so on and so forth. Maybe we'll have 10 of them. Maybe we'll have 100 of them. Maybe we'll have 1,000 of them. And then we'll release them all. You know, we'll make sure that they don't take over the world, of course, <laughs> self-destruct included. Uh, and then from there, we're gonna aggregate all the information that's coming from all these different agents, and somehow we wanna create, again, the map of the environment, right? So that's what we're trying to do. Of course, we need to model these to turn it into some sort of mathematical problem, so there's some basic things that we're gonna look into. Uh, I'll show you some uh, uh, videos also justifying this, but basically we have some sort of random motion happening in here too. So these guys, more or less, on their own, without this control, they try to move forward and then randomly change their direction, move forward, so 
Sometimes there's some curvature, of course, depending on the type of environment, um, but more or less we can model it somewhat like this, right? Some sort of exponential distribution, maybe moving forward, random uh, motion changes right or left. It depends on the insect that themselves, of course. And then in terms of communication, here are some of the challenges. Uh, so there's a lot of robotic uh, technology nowadays that allows you to localize yourself. For example, you're using your cell phones, right? It has GPS, inertial measurements, all these different things. Um, but for these guys, it's a little bit more difficult because these guys are going to go underground, so there's like rubble and all these different things. So GPS, anything like that is not going to be very useful. IMU is also not very reliable because these guys shake a lot, so you get a lot of noise added to them like all the time. So traditional methods basically don't work. Uh, so what we decided to do is actually figure out whenever like they're very close, relatively close to each other, let's say within a meter or two meters of distance, then we can reliably say that they're close to each other, and we just want to use that information, right? So we just want to say whenever they're close to each other, we're going to mark, mark that as some sort of event, and then we're going to construct basically a map out of all these different events that we have in here. Okay, so and let me show you here basically what their natural behavior looks like. And, and there's what, actually one more thing that I wanted to mention too is the fact that we do want to exploit as much as possible their natural behavior. Because as you can see, you can make them go in a particular trajectory, but that requires a couple of things. One of them is first that you actually see where they are, so you can provide some sort of feedback, which is a challenge on its own. Uh, also, like if you're sending a lot of commands to the little guy, the little guy gets tired, so eventually he just decides not to listen to anything that you're doing and just whatever. And it's like, doesn't die, but you know, it just ignores everything. So you don't want to send too many commands all the time because you're exhausting the actual uh, cockroach. Um, and, and also the backpack could actually die in terms of the battery, right? So you just want to send few commands once in a while to be able to do that. So this is basically some of the natural behavior. So one want to exploit that. So we took some simulations, and this is what you saw here on the right. Let me replay it here again. Uh, so you can actually model that basically in a, an environment, in a computer simulation environment. And what we want to do is, as I, as I started here, like we started all with them in one particular location, we are going to give them time to disperse over the environment. And we want to take advantage of these interactions that I mentioned so we can actually create this map of this scene. Right? Uh, and of course, we have some control over them. So if they decide to sleep for a long period of time, we can also tell them, OK, you know, give them a little kick and then start moving around again keep on exploring the environment, right? So those are the things that we have. Uh, this can actually turn into like an interesting control problem and so on, but we're gonna focus mostly on the mapping aspect of it, right? So this is the overall uh, idea, right? So we're gonna have something like a drone. This drone is basically the leader that's gonna herd the entire swarm. And then we have a bunch of these guys over here moving randomly around the location of that particular uh, uh, drone. Then the drone is going to start flying in one direction. And you can have multiple of these, right? So you want to parallelize all this thing. And there, but you're going to basically have this guy go in a particular trajectory, and then the swarm is going to follow it. And there's algorithms to do that. We've been working on that as well. You still have random motion, but just keep them within a particular area. Right? And as you're moving through, you're basically sweeping this environment. And every time, you're going to build a small map of the environment. Right? And then uh, each, one, each time, you're going to get a geometric estimation of the environment and a topological estimation of the environment. And then what you're going to do is you're going to stitch them together by identifying some key points between them. Uh, that's actually relatively trivial. And then we created this global map of the scene. Maybe it looks somewhat like this. Right? And here, I'm just giving you an illustration in 2D, but there's nothing stopping you from doing this in 3D. Uh, or on, you know, they, they cannot fly. These ones don't fly. Uh, I think Eve told me that there's a lot of cockroaches in Puerto Rico that fly really a lot, but these guys don't necessarily fly that much. Um, but uh, you know, they can go underground, so there may, may be tunnels and all these things, so you can reconstruct all of that. Right? So there's no constraints here for doing that. We're just going to focus on 2D in here. OK, so that's the general idea. So we're going to focus in particular on one challenge out of this task, which is the construction of this local map. So how do we build this? Again, we start with this map, some unknown environment, let these guys move around randomly. There's going to be some sort of events that we're going to use to be able to trigger basically the interactions between the cockroaches. Then we're going to take those events. We're going to create, uh, take them, use them as samples, create this point cloud representation that we have in here. Uh, and then from there, we're going to get some sort of estimation of what the geometry of the space looks like by creating some sort of graphical model. Basically, we're going to look, uh, build a filtration. We're looking, going to that in a second. And then from there, we're going to build or identify the robust 
uh, topological features of the environment. So this is where we start using some persistent topology to get this here. And of course, at some point, we need to be able to classify what is actually structure and what's noise, right? So this is where the more theoretical stuff comes into place because we want to come up with bounds saying, like, these are all the perturbations that I can get in here. Anything above that threshold is going to be basically like actual structure in the environment, right? And also, how long do you need to be able to analyze these and or you know, uh, how long do the cockroaches need to explore the environment and so on and so forth. So uh, as a quick introduction of uh, topological persistence, uh, many of you already probably know this and you, know, you might have seen some of these things basically in your uh, basic uh, topology course as well too. Let's imagine that you have some sort of manifold, some space here, so this is M. You're gonna have a bunch of samples, so these are the points in there, this is X. There's a distance between these samples that we are gonna consider, which is D. Uh, all these things provided to us. Uh, we don't know what the manifold is, of course. You know, we're just trying to in, uh, infer some information about the manifold. Uh, and then what we're going to do is that we're going to build all of these simplicial complexes. Uh, you know, single dots are going to be our zero simplices. One simplices are edges, two simplices, triangles, so on and so forth, filling, tetrahedra, so on and so forth. Right? Uh, now, how do we create a fil filtration out of a collection of points, like the one that we have in here? We're going to put a small ball al around each one of them, and I know it's a little hard to see, but there's a small ball uh, around each one of these guys of size epsilon. Right? And what we're going to do is that we're going to grow those balls. Right? Um, and then it may look somewhat like this. Right? So start growing some of these balls. Every time that these balls start intersecting, then we're going to add edges in between. If we have three of them that intersect, then we're going to draw a triangle. Four of them, tetrahedra, so on and so forth. Right? We keep on going like that, you know, gr balls grow, there's more connections, so we have more edges, triangles. Uh, keep on going like that, eventually everything is filled in because all the balls are intersecting to each other. Right? So what we want to characterize out of this particular filtration, so these are these sets and all these edges that we're uh, detecting, triangles and so forth, all these simplices, right, and there's an inclusion in here, we're just adding every single time. Right? So what we're trying to do is that we're trying to characterize the topological information that we get out of this particular uh, diagram uh, sequence that we have in here, right? So at some point we have a bunch of disconnected components. Eventually they start merging, and we end up, of course, with a single single connected component, which is this one over here. And uh, then what happens as well too is that uh, at some point, for example, here we start creating cycles, right? There's a cycle here. There might have been some smaller cycles that are created, and eventually they die because they get filled in really quickly. And one of them, for example, here seems to last for a longer period of time, but eventually it dies as well. Right? So we have this concept of connected components being born and dying because they merge, and also cycles being born because all of the signs get formed and then they die again because they get filled in. Right? So we capture all of that in this little diagram that you see over here. So those green dots correspond to the connected components. So we start with a bunch of connected components that are born at the same time, epsilon zero, so basically time zero. Uh, and then eventually all of them die really quickly because they start merging with each other, right? Because they're close to each other. But eventually one of them never dies because everything gets connected to that one uh, connected component. So that's the one that keeps on living until infinity. Then we have also cycles. And here you see that there's a, a small cycle that gets created some run of, around epsilon one, but it dies right away. So that's why it's very close to the diagonal. And uh, there's another one that is also born around the same time, but survives for a much longer period of time, eventually dies too. And that's this cycle that you have in here. Right? So our task, of course, anything that is born in terms of cycles in particular and dies really quickly, is going to be very close to that diagonal. So we want to separate those things from this diagonal, from those things that are farther away from the diagonal. And we want to create some sort of threshold in here that allows us to separate those two. Right? So that's uh, that, what we're trying to do. Now, really quickly, this is how we actually like built everything from here. So the way how we do it is, imagine, as you saw in the videos, you have all these different cockroaches that are moving around, right? So eventually, like these cockroaches cross paths or they get really close to each other. So let's say one and two, they're moving along, moving along. Eventually, they get very close to each other. So we're going to mark that as an event, right? So that's the first event. We're going to record the time. We're going to assume that they all have the same time reference, by the way. Um, and then there's a time, and then we're going to record the ID. So that's one and two, right? So this is my new event in here. Now, uh, three and four are moving along, and then eventually there's another event. There is, I'm just going to label that E3, and then maybe this guy moves along and then encounters with this guy, and then there's E2, right? Uh, and you know, the, the, the numbers don't necessarily need to be in sequence because I'm keeping track of the time as part of my event information. Now I have these three different points, right? So now in a more abstract sense, I have three different points. Uh, these are the events, E1, E2, E3, 
right? The problem is that these events don't happen in a place where I know where they are, right? I don't have GPS, so I have no idea where they happen. The only thing that I know is the time, right? So I can try to infer basically some uh, geometric information from the time, but I need to be aware of that the time is not necessarily accurate, right? So if two guys, all of the sudden, there was an event here and an event here, the cockroach, 100% sure, like it didn't go straight, right, from here to there, right? It took a detour, walked around, turn around, and then eventually met that other guy, right? So it gives me an idea of distance, but it's not correct, right? So I need to correct it somehow. Okay, but um, that's what I need to deal with. So, but what we're gonna do is that we're gonna start creating this simple graphical structure where we have these edges, uh, whenever we have two events that are related to each other, related in the sense that the same cockroach was involved in these two events, right, in a consecutive uh, manner. So E1, for example, and E2, like there's cockroach one that goes through both of them, so therefore I'm drawing an edge in there. Uh, same for E2, E3, there's another edge. And the weight is gonna be just my time difference, just to make it simple at this point. Again, this is not necessarily distance, but it's a proxy for that right now. Okay, and then what I can do is that I can actually build basically all these different, so this is an idea of distance between these, all these different nodes. So I can construct this graphical structure where you have all these different events, and I can compute distances between everything. Right, and uh, by using these local distances that I have. And then once I have all these local distances, then I can do the same thing that I was showing you before, put basically virtual balls around each one of these points, grow them, and start connecting things uh, as soon as they're close to each other. Right? So there's no an actual geometric mapping in here, we're just doing this in an abstract sense. Okay, now a couple of like simulations so you can see what it looks like. So this is the simplest case that you can imagine. Let's think of these cockroaches as being in a circle, right? So we have a bunch of these cockroaches that are moving around in a circle, some of them in one direction, some of them in the other direction. So they moved around, as you saw in here. Now, uh, of course, I can think of this as these cockroaches moving over time, right? So and then as they're moving over, over time, they're crossing their path once in a while. And there's also a particular time instance when this happens. And these are actually the events that I'm capturing, right? So I'm taking into account that. So this is another view, basically this is a top view of the same thing, so I'm, I'm having my manifold, but I'm adding time to it, and then you can see that, you know, that as I go out on the radial direction that corresponds to time, and then as they're moving around, there's some events, and these events are the points that I'm getting. Okay, so what is it that we're trying to do? We're trying to take all of these events that like happen here, and then I wanna abstract them out, I'm looking at the distance between all of them, and then eventually I wanna build basically some sort of connectivity, some sort of connection, graph that tells me that there's some sort of hole in there, right? So if I pick the right radius in here, for example, I may be able to construct this particular graph. But again, the challenge is that there's no one particular radius that may be correct. We need to somehow identify the radius or maybe even try multiple radii um, depending on the type of structure that we have. So that's part of the challenge. Here's another challenge, uh, and here's the fact that as we're getting more of these examples, let's say you have 100 cockroaches exploring a particular environment, you're getting a lot of these events, and you let it run for a period of time, right? Like these cockroaches are moving around for five, 10, 15, 20 minutes. You're getting more of these observations, but you're getting more of these observations over time, right? So there, you're actually trying to learn basically something that would look like a cylinder. So you're trying to extract the geometric information of a cylinder. You're not really, you're getting more information over time, but you're not really aggregating all of that information. What's happening is that you're getting more observations, but the space that you're trying to estimate is also getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it gets more difficult to actually estimate the uh, geometry from that particular setup. So what we had to do to be able to improve that particular uh, setup is imagine that you have some specific cockroaches that you're gonna tell, don't move, just stay there, right? Let them explore the environment, move randomly for a little bit, and then you're gonna select a subset of them. They're gonna become your landmarks. You have no idea where they are, but they're just your landmarks. You tell them stop, right? And those guys over here, they're not moving around. You could have even a small IMU sensor to make sure that they're actually not moving, right? So you can identify when that's actually happening. Uh, or if it's a natural behavior, just keep track of the ones that are actually not moving during that period of time, right? And those become your landmarks, and what you can do at that point is that anything that gets or happens close to that particular cockroach, then we know that it's happening in that, the same location, right? So then we can actually aggregate our space. So you're thinking of this cylinder that you have, uh, that you're trying to estimate, there, there's some rays, right? Vertical rays corresponding to those landmarks. You're pinching everything together at that point because you're saying like everything is identified to the same location, like more or less. It's not perfectly aligned, but more or less to the same location. So that's what we're gonna be using in here. 
So now you have an extra trade-off, right? So we have a trade-off in terms of how many of them should you have for landmarks, how many of them should be exploring around, how, for how long should you be exploring, how many of these cockroaches you need, and those are some of the things that we're trying to figure out for this application. So again, so what does this look like? And these are some examples using some sort of uh, some simulations. So we have uh, a subset of them that we selected as landmarks, and we have a bunch of them moving around. We looked at the interactions. It maybe looks something like this. Then we can actually look at the persistent diagram. We can see that there is a single connected component, no holes. So the holes would need to be above this threshold. And I'll tell you how we get to the threshold a little bit later. Uh, but for now, I guess at this stage, we're basically some, it's something that we're actually learning from the data itself. So we use a training set and a validation set for that. Uh, in this scenario too, same thing. But now you can see that you can, you're recovering the geometry better. Right, uh, and then here you are able to detect the fact that there is actually a connected component as well too. Uh, connected component and there is a hole, right? So that's a triangle that you have in here. The triangle is the hole. Uh, ignore the green one for a second, or the orange one for a second. Same thing over here. Now you have two holes, right? And you're able to detect two holes. Those are the two green or uh, red triangles that you have over here too. So you are basically able to infer that this is the topology of the space, and this is more or less the geometry of the space roughly speaking, right? Uh, you may get relatively good, this is something that actually happens for this type of applications, you may get relatively good geometry in terms of approximating distances appropriately, but the actual map, if you were to map it or plot it, could look really wrong, right? Uh, part of it is because there's also a lot of ambiguities in terms of distances when you're just computing distances. Okay, but uh, that's the general idea, right? That's what we're trying to do. Now, going a little bit more into like the math aspect of it, uh, as I mentioned, there's a lot of trade-offs between all these different things that we're doing now. So we want to somehow put all that information together and come up with some criteria saying, we need these many samples, we need these many cockroaches, we need to wait for this long, we need these many landmarks to be able to, um, be able to recover some sort of geometry of the space. And that's where we're going over here. So here, let me show you just briefly some of the assumptions that we're going to be making. Uh, just give you a little bit of an interpretation in here. I'm not going to go too much into the details here. But basically, the first two uh, uh, assumptions in here have to do with how many cockroaches you have and making sure that the events that, you are, that are taking place are actually happening often enough. Right? So as long as you have some information about that, uh, and these are just assumptions which you can meet once you have enough cockroaches in the environment, uh, then we're going to be able to recover geometry appropriately, and I'll give you some bounds on what appropriately means in a second. Uh, the second one is making sure that they are actually connecting, uh, or you're connecting enough of the cockroaches locally. So this is more of a physical consideration for the actual mechanical system. Right? So you have a, a, a backpack you know, with a radio transmitter. You want to make sure that you can connect that the ones are within a particular range. So that's more or less specifying that particular range. You, know, you need to have enough of them communicating. Of course, if, you are, if they never communicate, then there's nothing that you can recover. Right? So there needs to be a minimal radius. And that's what this is uh, implying in here. The last one has to do about the landmarks. If you really want to recover the geometry, you need to have enough landmarks. And the landmark is basically going to give you a bound on how much geometry you can actually recover. So that's what you have in here, too. And eventually, you want to have enough landmarks because you want to recover topology as well, too. right? If you don't have enough of them, then you're not able to recover it. And this is one of the theorems that we have. Uh, here, we're actually bounding basically the metric uh, information, basically the distances, how well you can actually approximate real physical distances for these type of scenarios. Uh, and here, more or less, this is the main result that we have in here. So if we take, if we let these cockroaches move around for a long enough period of time, uh, eventually what you're going to get is going to be something that looks somewhat like this. So this is an asymptotic result for, for the analysis, right? dm is the actual distance in the manifold. Uh, d epsilon l g whatever. This thing is over here is what we approximate. So what we approximate is going to be within a factor of the real distance in the manifold. You know, it's bounded above and below by that. Um, these times, of course, that factor. But you're, there's going to be an offset. And this offset over here, of course, has to do with this delta L, and the delta L is the distance between landmarks, right? So if you have a lot of landmarks, then, uh, or the landmarks are really far away from each other, then you're going to have a big offset, so your error could be some anywhere, uh, you know, big bound in there. Uh, but if you don't have them 
a lot of them and they're relatively close to each other, then this is going to get really small. Uh, of course, there's one particular uh, case that is important in here too, is that what happens if you actually have landmarks? You're looking at the distance between the landmarks. This is the distance between any two events. Uh, and then you can actually see that this term actually drops off at that point because you're at the landmark. But it turns out that you can approximate the distance relatively well at that point. So that, that offset comes up. But, uh, but that's only for the landmarks, and you may not necessarily have a lot of them. So there's a trade-off. You may always want to estimate, you know, I, I just want to know, for example, as the cockroaches are moving around, is this cockroach, how far is this cockroach from this cockroach, right? And these are the events over here, right? But the landmarks are the ones that are static, so, you know, there's always that trade-off in there. Okay, and of course, this factor is related to all the other constants that I introduced earlier uh, for the asymptotic analysis. Uh, there's also like an analysis for the topological estimation. So this is bottleneck distance on the persistence diagram. So I'm not going to go too much into the detail, but basically saying that the distance between the bottleneck diagrams in the persistence, so this is how well you can estimate the, uh, the topological structure, is also bounded by this constant lambda three and also, also the distance of the landmarks themselves, right? So you have enough landmarks, uh, then eventually you're going to be able to approximate this relatively accurately. So this tells you basically how big your geometric structure needs to be so you can actually recognize it. Right? And um, yeah, there's another diagram in there too. Let's keep that for a second. But uh, let me show you what this looks like uh, in terms of uh, the diagrams for the persistent, uh, or the bounds for the persistence diagram and the actual distance. So here, again, I, as I said, like I took a subset of them, I call them landmarks. And then if I try to compute the distance between the landmarks themselves, then these are all the distances that, that I computed. But I also know what the true distance is, of course. So this is the true distance, and this is my estimated distance. And you can see they're all like within this small cone. And the cone is basically, you know, the, the upper bound over here is one plus lambda three, right? So that's the slope of that particular line. So this is what you would expect. Uh, and of course, in simulation, we are able to verify that. Uh, now, if we're looking at any, any two points, so for example, where the cockroach is in here and here, then you have a much wider spread between them. And this is basically what we get because we have this landmark offset you know, due, due to how far the landmarks are from respect of each other. And again, this is just an, an offset on that direction. Uh, from topological persistence side of things, we have these diagrams in here too. And then we also see basically that this over here, so this is now looking at the ground truth. This is the ground truth uh, diagram. So this is the actual location of the hole for the true persistence diagram. This is what we estimate. So they may be relatively far from each other, but there's a threshold that we can estimate, and this is a threshold down here. So we're still able to recognize basically the right topology based on the threshold that we computed, uh, because we knew that this guy was above the threshold, so we should be able to compute it. So then as we estimate it, it's above the threshold. Right? Same thing over here, we have a similar analysis in here too. So it tells you that now you have some geometry and you're able to recognize it. Um, but the question, of course, at the end of the day is how do we actually use this in real life, right? So this is not all the way to real life, so we don't actually have cockroaches outside you know, doing all the exploration yet. Uh, or you see one with a backpack, please don't step on it. Um, but um, this is close enough, so uh, if some of you have played around with this, uh, this is actually a toy uh, that we've been using. Uh, it's the Hexbox Nano. If, uh, I don't know if, I think it's still continue, but a couple of years ago, maybe it was like a really fun toy, I guess, that a lot of kids wanted. You know, it just has like a little vibrator motor and then basically moves around randomly like a cockroach. So we'll see some videos in a second. We create a small uh, field over here environment. We put a bunch of them. We put some tape to emulate the ones that are not moving around. And then we recorded things with a camera and this is more or less what it looks like. So on the top right, you can actually see the uh, toy cockroaches, I guess, moving around, exploring the environment. Sometimes they just aggregate in a corner. Uh, that's interesting because it actually happens with the real cockroaches as well, too. Um, and yeah, and you can see them moving around. So we're keeping track of, we're looking back at the camera to keep track of the locations because they were too small to put a backpack in them. Uh, our cockroaches are actually much larger than that. Uh, so the, the idea instead is that uh, we just use a camera to keep track of them. That also gives us ground truth. Uh, but every time that they were close enough to each other, we said, like, okay, there's an encounter, right? So we emulated, basically, the radio communication. Uh, and it looks somewhat like this. You know, this is some of the tracking that you get. Um, so let me show you that again. So, you know, these are the landmarks are the blue ones, and these guys over here are the red ones interacting with each other. Uh, let me show you some of the results. So we tried three different environments. Same thing that I showed you in simulation, but we did it with these uh, uh, toy cockroaches. We were able to estimate the... Uh, the diagrams, of course, is in real life, it's a little bit more challenging than in the simulation, right? Um, 
And then we look at the persistence diagram, and we're able to get the right persistence diagrams. Uh, then we did a little bit of an analysis in terms of how many agents we have in there, and we wanted to verify some of the bounds that we had uh, from the asymptotic analysis. And you know, what was interesting is that actually we observed a similar behavior, so that our bounds from the asymptotic analysis were actually helpful, even in the cases when we had only a few number of cockroaches moving around. Right. Um, so this is some of the estimates in terms of distances. Of course, really bad at the really beginning, you only have five cockroaches moving around. Uh, you have now 15, 25, and once you get to 25, you start getting some uh, real information about the geometry of the space. Same thing about the topology. Eventually, you're able to have both of them being above the threshold. Interestingly enough, even though you have like really bad geometry at some point, you're able to get that topology well estimated in here. And by the way, to get these points, we actually manually had to like rotate the data and you know, kind of rotate it a little bit, align it properly so we can actually estimate these and get like the holes appropriately for visualization purposes. But the topology like, automatically gave us the information that we required. Uh, so this is another experiment that one of my students um, put together. So this is similar setup that we had before, but this time what we did is we actually put everything in a small platform. So we actually pushed it, uh, moved in that direction. So now you're gonna see the cockroaches kind of being swept from one direction to the other. This is actually more challenging than you can imagine um, we had a lot of problems on trying to get that to work. Uh, yeah, a lot of trips to Home Depot <laughs> to try to get this working, actually. So what happens sometimes, and, and we had to make that, the algorithm actually like, uh, robust to this, is as you'll see in a second, this thing starts moving to the, uh, to the side. This is an obstacle, so this is a piece of wood. Uh, sometimes the cockroaches would get stuck over here, or sometimes this would happen, right? This guy is just not going anywhere. Um, but then the cactus would get stuck in here, and this over here is it, another board, but we had uh, basically like a little brush on the bottom. So it would get stuck, and basically it would just get squashed and get out. Uh, so this, in our sense, corresponds to maybe getting or losing track of some cockroaches. Then what we had to do is like pick up the actual cockroaches. You'll see it eventually. I guess, and, uh, I guess we deleted that part. But uh, you know, we wanted to keep that PG. Um, so then we took some of those cockroaches and we would just throw them back inside, right? just manually, just throw them back inside. Um, and, uh, and again, that kind of emulated the fact that maybe we lost some cockroaches in the environment, but we wanted to keep some of them back. Uh, so we reintroduced some of them and the system was able to keep track of all those things and still recover the geometry of the space. Uh, so let me just fast forward really quickly to some of the actual estimations that you see. So you saw all of these. Eventually what you're getting over here yeah, that's the entire scene. But you see that uh, we sp split this up into small locations. We could do the whole thing, of course, but it's not very helpful to do the whole thing. But locally, we do some estimation. We obtain some of these maps, estimate some of this geometry. We stitch things together, and eventually we get this entire map of the entire scene that we have in here. So yeah, so those are the results for the cockroaches. And I think I still have maybe two to three minutes. So let me just give you a quick overview of how do we transfer all this information from roaches to humans, right? Um, so it's not that uh, we're the same, right? But uh, the idea is that we can actually use a lot of these techniques also to analyze basically the huma human behavior and maybe even physiological responses. So I wanted to clicky. I don't expect you to like read all these things, but this is basically a diagram that we're using for uh, part of the center that I'm part of. Uh, we have a lot of these. Uh, we imagine that we have people with a lot of different sensors, right? And, and it, these are going to be wearable sensors, like the watches that you have. But next generation, a lot more sensing capabilities. They're going to be self-powered, so you don't have to recharge them. So you get a lot of sensing modalities. Then you're going to put all that information into some sort of characterization of the environment and the human itself in terms of uh, their state, so on and so forth. Uh, we may need to do some sort of prediction. We, there may be some sort of performance feedback in here, too. Then maybe there's some sort of feedback to the user. If you're taking some sort of medication, there may be some dose treatment control that is happening in there. And of course, there may be some sort of monitoring or intervention system giving you some sort of notification as well. So there's all these things happening at the same time. Uh, and this is part of the big system. But of course, what we are focusing in here may be a little bit more on the human characterization side of things. Uh, and what we did is that we collected it in from, uh, uh, data from individuals performing different type of activities. So this is a workout room that we had, uh, different locations where they just rest and move boxes, perform exercises, so on for, so forth. Uh, different cameras tracking things, and of course a lot of different sensors. This is what it looks like. Now instead of having a cockroach with a sensor, we had a human with a bunch of the sensors in there. Uh, some of them characterizing physiological stuff, activity, environmental sensing, so on and so forth. And uh, these are some of the sensors that we put together, and I'll be happy to talk about 
that later on, but more or less this is what it looks like. Um, for some of it, we have some motion capture data so you can see the individuals performing different type of activities, bicycling, rowing, exercising, running, whatever. Uh, and then you're keeping track of some of their joint positions, IMU data, so IMU is inertial measurement units, so acceler acceleration mostly, uh, EKGs, you know, and then heart rate and respiratory rate, so on and so forth. But that's more or less what our data corresponds to. And what we're interested in doing is characterizing the different type of activities that individuals are performing, but also learning something about their physiological response. So I'm just gonna talk for 30 seconds about the activity recognition part of it. So the way how we do it, and this is how we introduce some of the topology aspect of it, is that we have some of these individuals performing some sort of motions, let's say like running or bicycling. Uh, and then if you're looking at a particular joint, and this is either motion capture data or accelerometer data, then you have some sort of like sinusoidal uh, pattern, right? From there, you can do this thing that is called delay embedding. So you're looking at one instance in time, and maybe, let's say, 10, 20 seconds into the past. If the window of time that is corresponding is proportional to the period, then what you may end up with is something that looks like this, right? So it's basically this is characterizing or is taken or constructed from these wavy signs that you have in here. You just subsample from there, then you can get some structure from there, and then maybe get some information about what the shape of this looks like, and then based on this shape, then we can characterize the different type of activities that we have in here. So we did that basically for different individuals uh, performing different type of activities, walking, walk, uh, waving, bicycling, golfing, so on and so forth. Uh, we get different type of topological si signatures from there, and we're able to characterize different type of activities. So this is more or less some of the activities. So this is just a little confusion matrix saying that you can characterize them well. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of cha challenges associated with that. And some of the challenges is that when you're looking at this, there may be s some outliers because the sensors are not great. So there may be some trajectories that look somewhat like this. And if you're trying to recover the topology, for example, of this particular system, when you have something that is over here, uh, or some trajectories that are just out of place for whatever reason, um, then you may not get a robust or good estimate, right? Uh, only when you have really good sensors, then you're able to do this directly on the data. Uh, but that doesn't always happen. So we're trying to figure out more robust ways of characterizing the topology fr from here. And of course, we want to do this like really fast too, because the idea is that at the end of the day, maybe something like this is going to be embedded on your watch, right? So we want to do this in an efficient way. So we've been looking at hierarchical approaches to try to come up with a better ways of counting not only points or samples, but also looking at how do we count trajectories so we can come up with better estimates of trajectory density at any given point and do that in an efficient way. So this is more or less what it looks like. You have a bunch of curves like this. Uh, you just sample based on density, point density. Uh, it may look like this, uh, but if you look at it based on trajectory density, maybe you get something that looks more like that. And then here you're able to estimate that, uh, the topology better, and that's something that we're working on. Uh, we're actually extending some theorems from stuff that we did before to this application in here. And basically, at the end of the day, we want to be able to do this in an efficient way. So if we wanted to count the number of uh, connected com or co number of trajectories that we have, we could just look at the small ball. The small ball, like in, in a circle, turns out to be the best thing that you could do. Uh, but it's not computationally the most efficient thing that you can do, so you may want to do squares. Uh, squares are really easy to do in a hierarchical way. You have thing, a, a lot of different structures, uh, quad trees, uh, KD trees, so on and so forth that you can use for that. Uh, but it's not very robust or stable, so we discovered that the hard way. Uh, so we had to figure out how to make it robust and stable, and in here we use some relative homology computations at the end of the day to do that. So I'll skip the details in there. Uh, but this is more or less what it looks like. So if you ever wanted to see what your signature, 3D signature for, let me see if I can get it here. There you go. 3D signature for you bicycling looks like. It looks like that. Yeah. After projecting it into some other space, this is actually walking, the one on the right. Uh, and that looks like that. So this is after projecting. Uh, that's interesting because bicycling is really much more of a uh, cyclic pattern, so that's what you get here. Uh, walking is this gait cycle where you get to stop once in a while, and then you lift up the leg and you stop again. So there's a, a lot more complex motion, and we are able to recover some of the structure from there in here. And I think I will stop right there. Okay, great, thank you.